The age in which we live is a truly remarkable age. The technological advances we enjoy today have enabled us to travel to any part of the globe within hours. They have enabled us to live longer and more comfortably than any generation in history. These technological advances have also enabled us to communicate to every point on the planet within seconds. And in addition to all of these benefits, the technological advances we enjoy today have enabled an ordinary men and women in our 21st century to tap into more information than any generation in history. Now with all of this information, ours should be the most knowledgeable and wise generation in history, but we're not. We're not because we have ignored God's instructions on how to gain wisdom. God has given us a book called the Bible, and in this book God tells us how to gain the wisdom we so desperately need. God is so concerned that we gain wisdom that he's even devoted an entire book in the Bible to the subject of wisdom and how to get it. That book, as many of you know, is the book of Proverbs. And the Lord willing, we're going to spend the next few months examining this very important book. Now, as pointed out a moment ago, the amount of information available to us today is absolutely staggering. In fact, it's so staggering that our age has been called the information age, and it really is the information age. Every day, thousands of, of newspapers are printed in almost every language on earth. Every month, thousands of magazines are published on nearly every conceivable subject, and even on a lot of subjects that most of us don't even know exist. <laughs> Tens of thousands of books are printed each year, and then there are the 24-hour news channels. These channels give us access to information from every country in the world, every hour of the day and night. We have newspapers and magazines and books and news channels feeding us a constant stream of information day and night, and if these aren't enough to satisfy our thirst for information, there's the Internet. The Internet is an amazing tool. It's a tool that has enabled ordinary men and women to obtain information from around the world and to do so by, pass, by, by bypassing large media organizations that have a terrible habit of just feeding us what they want to feed us. The amount of information available to us today is absolutely staggering. And with all of this information, ours should be the most knowledgeable and wise generation in history, but it is not. We have mountains of information, but we lack wisdom. We don't know what to do with it. In spite of all the data, we really don't understand the world we live in. And we certainly don't make good decisions. In fact, ours may be the generation that makes the most stupendously bad decision in the history of mankind. I know that's a broad statement, but it's absolutely true. Ours may be that generation that makes the most stupendously bad decision in the history of mankind, and the most stupendously bad decision in the history of mankind will be to make the Antichrist our ruler. You can't get worse than that. Based on the data I'm receiving from the internet and all these other sources, <laughs> The vast majority of men and women in the world today are philosophically and morally at odds with Jesus Christ. And at the same time, they are philosophically and morally attuned to the Antichrist. They really are. Now this is utter foolishness. To be at odds with the one who gives life while at the same time being attuned to the one who will only give death is to be intellectually and morally bankrupt. Yet, this is the mindset of our generation. 
Never has a generation had more information and never has a generation been more inclined to make the worst decision in history. So much for the benefits of being well-informed and well-educated. The most educated generation in history will make the most foolish decision in history. Have you ever noticed <clears throat> that when they have those round table discussions on TV, the people involved invariably declare with the utmost confidence that the answer to the world's problems is more education? If we could just give everyone a better education, they declare, we would solve most of the world's problems. Now, I'm going to sound like I'm anti-education. I'm not. I'm simply looking at the world the way it is, folks. Education has become the religion of the secular world. But it's a false religion. And it gives people false hope. If education made people wise then the wisest people on our planet would be the faculties of Harvard, Princeton, and Yale. And I can assure you they are not the wisest people on our planet. They're among, frankly, the most foolish people on our planet. Education obviously doesn't make people wise. So the question we have to ask ourselves then is this. Why is it? that a generation with so much information and so much education possesses so little wisdom. To put it simply, why do we lack wisdom? And the answer is also very simple. Our generation's lack of wisdom is a lack of wisdom because our generation has no fear of the Lord. And the fear of the Lord is, God says, the first step in gaining wisdom. So what does he know? He just made it all, folks. Now, this should be obvious. It's not obvious to most people. Proverbs 9.10. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, and knowledge of the Holy One is understanding. Job 28. And he said to man, the fear of the Lord, that is wisdom. Psalm 111.10, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. All who follow his precepts have good understanding. We could go on and on and on, but I don't really have to with this congregation. You get it. Why is it that a generation with so much information and so much education possesses so little wisdom? The answer is simple. Our generation lacks wisdom because our generation has no fear of God, and the fear of God is the first step in gaining wisdom. In fact, most of the men and the women in the world don't even recognize the existence of the God of the Bible, and they completely reject his instructions about how we should live our lives. To fear God is the first step in gaining wisdom, but the vast majority of men and women in the world today haven't even taken the first step by recognizing his existence. And because they haven't taken the first step, they're doomed to live without real wisdom. If you have embraced Christ, you have made the wisest decision a person can make. And I congratulate you on being wise. But embracing Christ is only the first step in gaining wisdom. It's the most important step to be sure, but only the first step. The Bible makes it clear that God wants us to live as wise men and women, and to live as wise men and women requires more than embracing Christ. If we are to live as wise men and women, we must obey God's instructions on how to live a wise life. Unfortunately, many of our Christian brothers and sisters don't obey God's instructions. I wish it was so that they did, but they don't. Many of these Christians have shunned wisdom and are living as fools. They started out well by embracing Christ, but they have failed to follow through by obeying his instructions on how to live wisely. Now, I realize that to a certain extent, 
we've all failed to gain as much wisdom as we should, and we've all made some foolish mistakes. <sighs> Painfully aware of that. But all of us are not equally foolish. Sadly, some Christians are absolutely over the top in living foolish lives. And this isn't necessary. God knew from the very beginning that we would be inclined toward foolishness, so he came to our aid by giving us a book called the Bible, a book that's filled with wisdom. And in the Bible, there's one particular book that's devoted to wisdom, and that book is the book of Proverbs. God has given us this book so that we can gain wisdom and rid ourselves of foolishness. The book's goal is to give us wisdom and to rid us of foolishness. Now, this goal is laid out in the first seven verses of this book. These are the Proverbs of Solomon, David's son, king of Israel. Their purpose is to teach people wisdom and discipline, to help them understand the insights of the wise. Their purpose is to teach people to live disciplined and successful lives, to help them do what is right, just, and fair. These Proverbs will give insight to the simple, knowledge and discernment to the young. Let the wise listen to these Proverbs and become even wiser. Let those with understanding receive guidance by exploring the meaning of these Proverbs and parables, the words of the wise and their riddles. Fear, the fear of the Lord is the foundation of true knowledge. But fools despise wisdom and discipline. A powerful seven verses. Now, before plunging into this great book that is devoted to God's wisdom, and the Lord willing, we're going to spend about 14 or 15 Sunday mornings talking about this, we do need to spend a little bit of time discussing some of the general characteristics of this great book. This will, I hope, help us all understand it a little better. Now, to begin with, we need to define the word wisdom. As we have already noted, information is not wisdom. You can have your head filled with information and not be wise. You can even understand that information and not be wise. To be wise, you must be able to properly apply the information you possess to your life. One man defined wisdom this way. Knowledge is the apprehension of truth in one's mind. But wisdom is the application of truth in one's life. It's a good definition. Charles Ryrie defined wisdom this way. Wisdom is the use of knowledge in a practical and successful way. Now both of these are very, very good definitions of wisdom. But I prefer a simpler one because I'm a simple man. Wisdom is the art of skillful living. Wisdom is the art of skillful living. The wise man is the man who knows how to live life skillfully. And God really does want you to live life Skillfully. That's the reason he put the book of Proverbs in the Bible. Live a skillful life. Don't go out and just flail around and fall apart. Live life skillfully. The book of Proverbs is devoted to that end. It's devoted to teaching us how to live skillfully. Now, skillful living is not necessarily the art of getting rich or the art of becoming powerful. Skillful living is the art of making a good life for yourself. If you want to make a life worth living, you need wisdom. You need to learn the art of skillful living if you want to have a good life. The book of Proverbs will help you do just that. It's also important that you keep a couple of things in mind as we work our way through this wonderful book. First of all, the most important requirement in living a good life is to get right with God. 
The most important requirement of living a good life is to get right with God. Without getting right with God, all that you do will be a waste. If you don't get right with God, you will fail at this thing called life. We all are here for a few years. If you don't get right, right with God, it's a waste. I don't care how rich you are, how powerful you are. You can win Nobel Prizes, do all sorts of really neat things. If you don't get right with God, your epitaph is failed at life. Failed at life. So that's the first requirement. Secondly, once you get right with God, you need to learn how to live life skillfully. And that is what the book of Proverbs wants to teach you. And now, before jumping in, we're going to have a few introductory messages just to prepare you for the book. Because the truth of the matter is, Proverbs is a terribly misunderstood book. And we'll talk about that more next week. It, it is probably one of the most misunderstood books in the Bible. Some, some folks will say, well, no, that must be Revelation. I would argue it's the book of Proverbs. And we're going to try to solve some of those problems next week. But a little, a little, excuse me, a little additional information. The book of Proverbs was written primarily by Solomon with additional Proverbs from a man named Augur about whom we know nothing, a man named Lemuel about whom we also know nothing, and then there were some men simply known as the wise men about whom we know nothing as well. But God inspired all of these men to write their Proverbs and for Solomon and others to include them in this book. Now the major role... Solomon played in writing the book of Proverbs is made clear in the text itself. Proverbs 1.1, the Proverbs of Solomon, son of David, king of Israel. Proverbs 10, the Proverbs of Solomon. Proverbs 25.1, th these are more Proverbs of Solomon copied by the men of Hezekiah, king of Judah. Now Solomon was a fitting author of this book because according to the scripture he was the wisest man who ever lived. So it was altogether sensible for God to choose the wisest man who ever lived to write a book on wisdom. Now most of you know the story, Solomon being blessed with wisdom. For those of you who don't, it happened this way. Shortly after Solomon became king, God came to him in a dream and asked him what he could do to bless Solomon. You want wealth? You want power? What do you want? Solomon very wisely said, give me wisdom. I need wisdom to rule this incredible people. And God gave him wisdom. This is what was recorded God said, I will do what you have asked. I will give you a wise and discerning heart. And there will never have been anyone like you, nor will there ever be. The wisest man who ever lived. I tend to think he was also the smartest man who ever lived. I can't prove that. <laughs> but I think so. And I think his genes have been spreading through the Jewish people, which is why we have so many Jews who are Nobel laureates. Perfect sense. Perfect sense. There are a number of other reasons for that as well. But he made him the smartest man, the wisest man who ever lived. And the Jews are still benefiting from those genes. You think God wouldn't do that? You don't know God. You think otherwise. 1 Kings chapter 4. God gave Solomon wisdom and very great insight and a breadth of understanding as measureless as the sand on the seashore. He spoke 3,000 proverbs, and his songs numbered 1,005. Men of all nations came to listen to Solomon's wisdom, sent by all the kings of the world who had heard of his wisdom. And he knew about science as well. He knew about all sorts of architecture, art, music. It just went on and on and on and on. He was a very erudite man, a man who just knew about everything. God said, I will make you wise. I will make you smart. And when God sets out to do that, it gets done. <laughs> Solomon, we're told, spoke 3,000 proverbs and his songs numbered 1,005. Obviously, many of Solomon's proverbs did not make it into the Bible or this series of messages over the last two or three years. Some of you are saying amen for that, right? Now, in telling us that Solomon spoke 
3,000 Proverbs, the Bible seems to suggest that Solomon's wisdom was measured to a certain extent by the number of Proverbs he spoke. This raises two important questions. Number one, what exactly are Proverbs? And number two, why did God use them? Now the answer to the first question is this. Proverbs are short, pithy statements to summarize wisdom. Short, pithy statements to summarize wisdom. The Spanish poet Cervantes defined a proverb in a wonderful way. He said, a proverb is a short sentence based on long experience. (laughs) Short sentence based on long experience. Now for the second question. Why did God have his book on divine wisdom written in Proverbs? The answer is this. Very simple. Proverbs are easy to remember. Proverbs are easy to remember. Someone might ask, wouldn't it have been better if God had given us some long, well-developed sermons on the subject of wisdom? Well, to be sure... God has given us a lot of long, well-developed sermons on a variety of subjects, but they're often hard to remember. I have a hard time remembering what I preached on last month. And if I have a hard time as a preacher remembering what I preached on last month, what hope is there for listeners? Proverbs, on the other hand, are easy to remember. It's hard to remember all of the elements in a long sermon, but a short, pithy statement is not at all hard to remember. And in addition to that, Proverbs often pack a very powerful punch. Long sermons, hmm, you can go to sleep on some of those, as some of the folks in the back are doing right now, right? I see you back there. Proverbs punch pack a very powerful punch. For example, in Proverbs 11 we read, Like a gold ring in a pig's snout is a beautiful woman who lacks, who shows no discretion. Now that's a very powerful statement. Like a gold ring in a pig's snout is a beautiful woman who shows no discretion. Now this visit of wisdom comes across a lot more forcefully than a lengthy lecture to our sons and daughters on not allowing physical attractiveness to be the determining factor in choosing a mate. You can have a long lecture. Don't just look at the outside, look at the inside. Don't look at the outside, don't look at the inside. But this one, a gold ring and a pig snout, that packs a powerful punch. That young man or that young woman may look good, son or daughter, think gold ring, But he or she may be a pig. (laughs) You think that's not true? We all know that's true. That's the reason there was this wave of nervous laughter throughout there. (laughs) But unfortunately, that's how we move. That's how we move. That man, that woman may be attractive, think gold ring, but it may be a gold ring in the snout of a pig. Every young person in this room, pay attention. This is for you. Proverbs 16. Pride goes before destruction. A haughty spirit before a fall. All of you have heard this. Now this bit of wisdom is much easier to remember than a lengthy sermon on the foolishness of pride. There are ten words in the English translation and only seven in the original Hebrew. So few words that even a child can remember this proverb easily. Proverbs, as one man wrote, are like burrs that stick to the brain. You can't get rid of them. They stay with you and your children and your grandchildren for generations. And it's because of this that most cultures and nations create proverbs. They do so to pass on wisdom from one generation to the next generation to the next generation and so forth. An example, 2,300 years ago, a philosopher, Greek philosopher named Zeno wrote this proverb. 
the reason why we have two ears and only one mouth is because we need to listen more and talk less. Now, I've heard this bit of wisdom a number of times over the years, and I might add long-winded preachers need to hear it often. The reason we have two ears and one mouth is because we need to listen more than we talk. Now, I always thought that this proverb originated with Ben Franklin. It sounds like a Ben Franklin proverb. He loved writing proverbs. A number of the founding fathers loved writing them. They published them, and they were just bits and pieces of wisdom to help people put their lives together. I was amazed. It was only in studying this book of Proverbs that I discovered that it was written by Zeno 2,300 years ago. That's how powerful Proverbs are. It's been hanging around, and each generation sort of claims it as its own. That's why God gave us a book of wisdom written in Proverbs. They pack a powerful punch, they're easy to remember, and they tend to stick with you like burrs on the brain. And God wants you to have these bits of wisdom like burrs on your brain so you don't forget them. The age in which we live is a truly remarkable age. The technological advances we enjoy today have enabled us to tap into more information than any generation in history. And I confess, I love it. I'm a bit of a news junkie. I like collecting data. I like knowing what's going on. Unfortunately, it's depressing at times <laughs> because most of what I see going on ain't good. Now, with all this information, ours should be the most knowledgeable and wise generation in history, but we are not. We are not because we do not fear God. We just take him for granted if he exists. We don't care. And even those who do fear God often don't obey, obey his instructions. God has given us the Bible to help us gain the wisdom we so desperately need. And in particular, he's given us the book of Proverbs, a book devoted to gaining wisdom. God wants us to be wise. God wants us to be skillful at living. And my prayer is that as we go through this book, we will become skillful at living and in doing so, have good lives. I want you to have a good life. God wants you to have a good life. Step one, embrace Christ. After that, you need to follow the instructions he lays down. God, this is a very practical book. It's very spiritual, but it's also very practical. It's how to get up, go to work, do the job, plan a life that works. Sadly, a lot of Christians don't have lives that work very well. And I hope if you're one of those, you'll pay attention to this book and learn the art of skillful living. We all can improve on that. Let's pray. Father, we love you. We worship you. We thank you for being our God. We thank you for being so concerned about our well-being, even here, that you give us a book on wisdom. I pray that we'll take it to heart and that we'll be a church filled with men and women who are skilled at living and do all of these things to your glory. In Jesus' name we pray.